Good morning, Liverpool family. Uh, we are live here in Snowpocalypse 2019, and uh, we are doing a, a little bit of a different thing, obviously, because there's so much snow that we do not desire for your death. Uh, so I wanted to make sure I, I got a lot of wisdom around this, and since we have this this medium of uh, social media and Facebook and all that, we decided it would be a really good idea to uh, to do this Facebook Live thing. So um, it is an historic day for Liverpool Christian Church because uh, in the nine years that I've been here at this church, we have never canceled service uh, since I've been here. And so it's a pretty big day for us here. I want to say big thanks to Amber and Kimber uh, for all of their work for the parent conference yesterday. It was absolutely fantastic. I am so proud of them for all of the work that they put into it and for everything that they did and for all of the knowledge that I gained uh, to be a better parent, more loving, more gracious, more kind, better for my children uh, in the long run. So today we're going to talk about prayer and uh, our our series is called Together. This is the third week, I think, uh, in the series. And today we're going to be talking about this idea of being able to pray more together. Um, you can see right behind me, I wrote on the board that prayer is a battlefield. I fully believe that prayer is a battlefield. I think that all of our spiritual battles uh, are fought and won or lost on the battlefield of prayer. The Bible tells us in Ephesians that our battle is not against flesh and blood, which means that if we are battling someone in our life, um, it is not actually a physical battle. It's not actually a flesh and blood battle. It's a spiritual battle. And the Bible calls it a battle because we wage war on sin in our lives through prayer. This is the whole idea of prayer, that prayer is a battlefield where we fight against our own sin and we fight against the battles that we may or may not have with other people. Prayer is a discipline. Prayer is something that I think we grow into. I think that prayer is a catalyst for our spiritual growth. And I think that prayer is a catalyst for a church that is going to grow and do what Jesus wants them to do, to love God, love others, to serve the world, to point people to Jesus. So the idea today, we can pray more together. We can pray more together. Uh, by the way, wherever you are joined or watching, um, I think it would be fun if you took a picture of that and posted that in the comments. That could be fun if you have more than one device and uh, and you could do that. So maybe you can try and do that. A couple things I want to go into today about prayer. Uh, I think we can pray more when we know why we pray. I want to give you three reasons for why we pray. The first one is this, and I think it's very simple. Uh, we pray so that we will be connected. We pray so that we will be connected. Now, obviously, there's a connection that happens with Jesus, but I think there is also a connection that Jesus wants us to have with each other. And so we, we connect to Jesus in prayer and we connect to each other in prayer. Jesus wants us to be connected on the same page, seeking good and seeking his will. In John 17, uh, as Jesus was approaching his crucifixion and death, he prayed for you and me. And he said, I pray for all of those who will believe in me that they will be one. Jesus wants us to be one. Jesus wants us to be united in purpose. And so we pray so that we will be connected. We also pray because it's commanded. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, he says, uh, Paul writes, devote yourselves to prayer. Devote yourselves to prayer. Now, that is an important word to devote because devotion takes time. Devotion takes practice. No one who ever won an Olympic gold medal said, yeah, I just, uh, I picked this up last week and I thought it would be fun to try out for this world stage. Uh, none of that has ever happened. It's always a, a time thing. It takes time and practice to be devoted to prayer. I also think that being devoted to prayer means that we need accountability. Um, we need someone in our life who can say to us, 
hey, dude, or chick, or whatever it may be. Have you prayed today? Have you been praying today? And this, this person that we have in our life who holds us accountable to prayer, not only are they holding us accountable to something we should be doing anyway, but they are in a way connecting us back to themselves, back to Jesus, and it's this whole cyclical thing where when I pray, I'm connected to Jesus. When someone holds me accountable to prayer, they are connecting me to Jesus and to them. And it's a really, really beautiful thing. Paul says, devote yourselves to prayer. It takes time, takes practice. Uh, how many of you might remember the first time you ever prayed. Uh, maybe some of you can remember the first time you ever prayed in a group of people and how you felt like the entire world was watching you and that everything was going to collapse and it was going to be a colossal nightmare. Uh, by the way, that didn't happen. And so you're okay. Uh, and so we have this, um, time and practice, time and practice, time and practice, time and practice thing in order to be uh, actually devoted to prayer. Third reason why we pray is this. We pray to align ourselves with God's will. We pray to align ourselves with God's will. Uh, Philippians 2.13 says, God works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. God wants to fulfill his purpose in your life. And one way for that to happen is for us to submit ourselves to prayer. People will often ask me, um, I, I'm trying to say, I'm trying to figure out what God's will for my life is. I want to figure out um, if this thing or that thing is God's will for my life. You know, should I marry this person or that person? <laughs> Hopefully, you know, you don't have that come up too often. Um, but they ask that, should I take this job? Should I move to this city? Is it God's will for me to move to this city and take this job? Now, personally, I don't believe that Jesus cares if you take this job or that job. That doesn't align us with God's will if we take this job or that job or whatever. The thing that I think God's will for our life is, is that we leave sin we leave sin behind and we become or are becoming more and more obedient to him. This is God's will for your life. This is God's call for your life that you would leave sin and that you would come into a connection or a relationship with him. And so if you've ever wondered or been praying about God's will for your life, and I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm not saying don't do that. I am suggesting, however, that God's will for your life is much greater than your career choice or what city you want to live in. God's will for your life is that you would leave sin and be connected to him. And I think that this is one of the greatest reasons that we pray. We pray and submit ourselves and who we are to Jesus so that we can be aligned with his will through that. Okay, so there's a couple reasons why we pray, three reasons to be precise. Um, I want to talk about uh, how, how to do this. We, we can pray more when we know how to pray. I'll give you four just so you know where we're at, okay? The first way or the first idea for how to pray is this. I think we should be praying comprehensively comprehensively. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 18 and 20, around there, he says, pray in the Spirit on all occasions. Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Be alert and always keep on praying for God's people. Always keep on praying for the Lord's people. One mistake that I think that we make or that people make in prayer is that uh, we're withholding. We are withholding when it comes to our prayer. We don't pray comprehensively. For some reason, we imagine that uh, we'll just leave some stuff out. I'll just leave some stuff out because, you know, if I don't say it, it must not be true. But Jesus knows everything anyway. And so I, it's absurd to me that we would leave certain things about ourselves, about our sins, about our struggle out of our prayers. In addiction counseling, I learned uh, a word. When we do this in addiction counseling, it's called a half measure. A half measure, meaning it's an incomplete thing. It's not really uh, taking care of the issue. It's not really a submission. And it is in 
complete. It is an incomplete thing. Now, here's something that everybody, all people in the entire world, anybody who wants to talk to Jesus ever about anything, everybody needs to understand this. Jesus does not dismiss you. Jesus does not dismiss you. He does not hear your prayers and go, ah, that guy's stupid. He doesn't know anything. Listen to his little baby prayer. He doesn't even know how to pray. Like that is not what Jesus does. He does not dismiss us when we bear our souls to him. In fact, he actually draws closer to us when we are comprehensive, when we are fully divulgent in our prayers. I'm saying I think it's very important for us to be fully honest and fully transparent when we talk to Jesus in prayer. I mean, he knows everything anyway. We can't hide anything from him. And so the only person we're hurting when we're not comprehensive with our prayers is ourselves. We're actually lying to ourselves by keeping a dark thing hidden over here that we refuse to talk to Jesus about. And it's absolutely absurd. So if you're going to start praying, and by the way, it takes time and practice, you know, practice over time, and it takes accountability. I suggest that you begin by doing it comprehensively. Another way of how to pray is this. Uh, the Bible says we should be praying continuously. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16 and 18, he says, rejoice always, rejoice always. Okay, well, there's times where I don't want to rejoice. There's times I'm not rejoicing that you're all at home and it's we're stuck in snow and all that stuff. Uh, I'm not rejoicing. I should, I should repent of that, honestly. Uh, but he says, rejoice always. Pray continually. Pray continually. Uh, raise your hand if you find that might be a little bit difficult. I think it could be a little bit difficult to pray continually. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So how do I pray continually? How do I pray continually? The first thing I think we need to know, if we're going to be people who pray continually, is that uh, there is no limit to your prayers. I mean, Jesus says don't babble on and on and on, right? Just so that you're not going to get a better answer by using fancy words or anything like that. There's no limit to how many times we can bring something before Jesus. And there's no location that binds us. Honestly, I've told people before, and I'll say it again, you should be praying while you poop. Okay, Instagram can wait. And by the way, I know you're on your phone when you're in the bathroom because you're normal and everybody does that. So <laughs> your, your Instagram, I'm going to double tap on that. It's going to be great. That can wait. All right. Pray while you poop. Pray while you shower. There is no limit to where or when you can pray. And so my encouragement is that you would pray continuously. And, and then the way that you do that is to understand that there's nothing off limits in prayer. There's no place that I can't pray. And so no matter where I am or what's going on, if I think I need to bring this to Jesus, I can boom, bring that to Jesus right then and right there. This is an ongoing thing for us. You never have to turn off your prayers. It is a daily ongoing conversation with Jesus. You never have to log on. You never have to log off. And listen, please understand this. Prayer is just talking to Jesus. It's just talking to Jesus. It's just speaking with him. It's just talking with him. It's just having a conversation with him. So pray comprehensively, get it all out there. Pray continuously, anytime, any place, anywhere. Thirdly, pray confidently. In Hebrews chapter 4, uh, the author writes, Jesus empathizes with our weaknesses. Jesus empathizes with our weaknesses. Why? Because he was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet Jesus did not sin. So because Jesus empathizes with our weakness, because Jesus was tempted in every way and did not sin, he says, let us approach God's throne with confidence, confidence to receive mercy and grace. 
You don't get what you don't ask for in anything. You don't get what you don't ask for. And the writer of Hebrews says that we should approach God's throne with confidence, knowing he's not going to dismiss us. He's not going to send us away, knowing that when we approach his throne with confidence, we will receive mercy and grace. Jesus knows your struggle. Understand that. Jesus knows your struggle. He knows what you're going through. The Bible is very clear. He was tempted in every way, yet did not sin. So that means if Jesus knowing our struggle means that there's nothing off limits. There's nothing that we can't talk to him about. And we can trust and have confidence that he's going to listen and that he loves us and that he's not going to dismiss us. So we pray comprehensively. We pray continuously. We pray confidently. Lastly, in this, we pray collectively. The Bible is very clear that churches should be praying together. We, the church, Liverpool family, we can pray more together. Acts 2.42 says they devoted themselves to prayer. There's that word devotion again, that it takes time and practice. They, the church, they devoted themselves to prayer. In Acts 4. 23 says they raised their voices to God in prayer. They raised their voices to God in prayer. Prayer is an individual thing for sure, something that you can do privately and alone, but it's also something that we can do collectively and corporately as a church. We can pray more together. Now, I want to talk about uh, two kinds of prayer really quickly. Um, and it's not going to be much longer, so uh, hopefully you haven't already passed out in your pajamas or whatever is doing, whatever is going on at your house right now. By the way, I have coffee. Thank you, Sarah Berkey, for always keeping me stocked. Oh, Amber, tell Sloan that I say hello. All right, so in the book of Nehemiah, um, there's a really great story in the first two chapters of Nehemiah. And I want to give you two kinds of prayer to focus on from Nehemiah chapter 1 and chapter 2. Now, Nehemiah was a Jewish person, and he was living in a foreign kingdom under the king Artaxerxes. Try and spell that if you can. All right, that's a tough one. Um, but ne uh, Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the king. He was the cupbearer, and so he would bring his wine, he would take a sip, make sure nobody poisoned it. And Nehemiah gets word that his homeland, all the way back at home, wherever he's from, his homeland is lying in ruins. Like the, the places where his, his ancestors are buried, the city is all jacked up, the walls are falling down, it's completely and totally in shambles. And Nehemiah hears about this and he is, his heart is broken. Like Nehemiah is cut to the quick. Now, I don't know if you love the city where you came from, but if I heard something about Newport News, his walls are down, I think I'd be like, yeah, you know what? I haven't been there in 25 years. I'm sure they'll figure it out. Like, I don't know if I would have the same attitude as Nehemiah, just being honest. And so Nehemiah hears this news about his city, about Jerusalem. And, and he, and this is what it says he does. This is his response to hearing the news. In Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4, Nehemiah says, When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. Almost as if he couldn't keep going. He couldn't hold on. He had to stop. He had to do something else because he could not handle the news of his city being in the shape that it was in. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days, some days, I don't know, 25, 3, I have no idea. But for some days, he says, I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. The first kind of prayer that I want to talk to you about from Nehemiah is what I call carpet fiber prayers. Carpet fiber fiber prayers. Now, a carpet fiber prayer is very simple. Um, you lay on the ground with your face in the carpet and your forehead in the carpet fibers, and you are totally strewn out in front of Jesus. You are laying there with your forehead in the carpet, and you know you've had a carpet fiber prayer when you get up from it and you got like lines in your forehead, all right? That is a carpet fiber prayer. And this is what I call, this is what I think Nehemiah is doing here. He, I think he's praying a carpet fiber prayer. This is a serious 
thing to him that he has to bring to Jesus. And so he is very taking it very seriously. He's setting aside time. He's fasting. He's praying. He's mourning. He is carpet fiber praying. Now, there have been things in your life where this is the kind of appropriate prayer that we should be doing. Carpet fiber praying, completely laid out in front of God. You take everything, Jesus. You take all of this. You take all of me. Help me. Help me. This is the pleading. Now, for someone's prayer life, I call this the meat and potatoes kind of a prayer. Um, this is the kind of prayer that sustains us spiritually. This is the kind of prayer that we do that would bring us uh, the the time and practice and devotion that the Bible is calling us to in prayer. These prayers are serious, okay? These prayers are very serious. They take more than a few seconds, and they have a significant impact on your life, your family, your church, and anything else that you're doing. These are very significant prayers. Carpet fiber prayers. Uh, anybody ever done that? Anybody ever had to do that? I've definitely had to do that in the life of this church um, as a pastor, just as a Christian dude, um, fighting for certain things that I needed in my family and in my life. And so I've had these times of carpet fiber praying. Now, this is the meal. This is what feeds us. This is the time and devotion. This is the time and practice that I'm talking about. Now, next to carpet fiber prayers, there is another kind of prayer that I call a popcorn prayer. Now, I don't know if you have popcorn in your house right now, um, but this is a great reminder. Pop, this is microwave popcorn, so it's kind of not like the best thing in the world. Actually, it's garbage. I don't even allow it in my house, um, but I'll probably take some of this home. I hope I don't choke on this on camera. If I do, somebody come and give me the Heimlich or something real quick. Now, a popcorn prayer is different from... A carpet fiber prayer. Hang on, I gotta get rid of this popcorn in my mouth. A carpet fiber prayer is different from a popcorn prayer. Now, a carpet fiber prayer is a more sustained prayer. It's much more serious. It's a it's a prayer that fills you up. A popcorn prayer is very necessary, but it doesn't require the same level of time and commitment necessarily that a carpet fiber prayer does. Now, in Nehemiah chapter 2, he wants to go and ask his king to go home to Jerusalem and see if he can do something about how in shambles their city is. In, in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1, he says this, In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. Nehemiah says, or he writes, I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Verse 4, the king said to me, what is it you want? Nehemiah's response is this. When the king, when the, the king says, hey, Nehemiah, you're sad. Everything's terrible. What do you want? And then the, the, the verse says in verse 4, I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king. I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king. Now, this is a popcorn prayer. Nehemiah did not say, thank you for asking me what do I want. Thank you for asking me what do I need. I'll be right back and go lay in the carpet and come back an hour later. This is not what Nehemiah did. Nehemiah's response when the king asked him the question is to simply throw up a popcorn prayer and say, God, help me in this situation. I'm calling you down into this situation that you will help me, that you will guide me in this, that the king will not lop my head off for trying to leave town or anything like that. This is a popcorn prayer. Popcorn prayers pop up all throughout your day. Nehemiah, before he answered the king, threw up a popcorn prayer. God, help me in this right now. Now, imagine if you, during your day, began to think about how and when and where you could throw up these popcorn prayers. 
You're going into a tough meeting or a tough conversation or you're going to answer a tough question. Before you speak out loud, you say something to God like, God, bless this conversation or God, open my heart to you or God, help me in this or God, lead me in this. Popcorn prayers have the power to change you and any situation that you find yourself in. However, it's just popcorn. It's not a meal. We are not sustained by popcorn prayers. We have to have carpet fiber prayers as well. They are a snack. They are not a meal. Popcorn is not a meal. I don't care how many times you've tried that in your office and stunk up the whole place because you burnt the popcorn. It is not a meal. A popcorn is a snack and a popcorn prayer is a spiritual snack as we are taking the time and practice to devote ourselves to prayer. So maybe you've never prayed before in your life and you don't know how to get started. I'm gonna teach you right now how to get started. Okay, first thing is this, just make a decision, okay? Make a decision. I'm gonna pray. And then you just go, hey Jesus, da, 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 whatever thing you want to say to him, that's how you start. It doesn't matter where you are or what's going on. Now, a lot of people close their eyes when they pray, that's fine too. If you're going to pray while you're driving, I encourage you not to do that. That's an old preacher man joke, but I threw it in there because I wanted to. Now, when I asked on Facebook what stops people from praying, almost everybody, unequivocally, distractions. Everybody said that there's a distraction, distraction, distraction. Here's my encouragement to you. If you want to pray and talk to Jesus and you don't want to be distracted, uh, first of all, it's not going to happen. You're going to be distracted. But have a notepad next to you. When that distraction pops up in your brain, write that thing down and then it goes away. Right? You don't have to try and remember it. Oh, I'll get to that after I talk to Jesus. Just write it down really quick. So, you're going to decide that you want to pray. You say, hey, Jesus, da, 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 whatever that is, uh, inevitably something about unicorns riding uh, unicycles or whatever is going to come through your brain. You write that down. You don't have to think about it anymore. Next is this. Ask everything in Jesus' name. I, I always close my prayers with, in Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' name, amen. Because that power that Jesus brings to prayer is so much more than anything that I can ever do. It's the most powerful force in the world, the name of Jesus. Think about that. I mean, Jesus had the power to come up out of the grave, right? He defeated death. And so my little prayer about how I want this thing or that thing or whatever thing going on is, is really ultimately um, pales in comparison to the power that Jesus comes on top of it with. Then I say amen, all right? Now, amen is a very churchy word. It's a very Christianese word, but it just means let it be, all right? It just means let it be or let it be so. Uh, I say, I ask Jesus for this thing, this thing, this thing. I say, thank you for this thing, this thing, or this thing, or whatever. Now help me go and do this thing, this thing, or this thing. And I say in Jesus' name, because of the power of his name, amen, let it be so. It's almost like the, 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 uh, the gun that goes off at the start of a race, let it be so, and then you go and do whatever the thing is that you have just completely, comprehensively, fully given over to Jesus. Now, my question for you today, what is stopping you from praying right now? I see all these people who have uh, have logged on and are listening, and I'm about done, all right, I'm almost done. Um, what is stopping you right now from when this little Facebook Live thing ends, from grabbing someone's hand, your kid, your spouse, whoever it might be, uh, or just yourself and praying to Jesus. Absolutely nothing is stopping you. Listen, go back to the beginning. Prayer is a battlefield. Prayer is a battlefield where we fight for our souls, where we fight for uh, submission to Jesus, where we fight to be aligned to God's will. My encouragement to you today is to begin to pray and go to war. Go to war in prayer. And why don't you stop right now and do that? Thanks for joining us today. Hopefully we'll see you next week and uh, there won't be any more snowpocalypse. Have a great day.